Dialogue is everything. And dialogue, more than anything else, creates character and creates story. Because the more your character is feeling, the more important it is to really convey that in what they're saying or even not saying. And will be perceived by the reader and anyone watching the performance. Now, there are three main functions of dialogue, which are to impart information, reveal character, and move the story forward. So as you're writing your dialogue, think about what purpose it's serving. And it could be serving two of those points or even all three. But if it's not doing its job, then think about what you can do to change that. Now, as far as giving information is concerned, one of the ways of doing that is exposition, which just means a kind of detailed way of imparting knowledge or information. But be very wary of that because a whole watch of text on the page where one character is explaining something quickly becomes really tedious. So what you want to do is try and break that up. So think about the way it was done in the film Chinatown. Jack Nicholson in one scene has to give us lots of information, but the way it was broken up was the scene is him in the back of a car and he's searching all through his jacket pockets trying to find a lighter because he's desperate to light his cigarette. And what that did is it gave us some action, it broke up what he was saying, it wasn't just spewed at us, it was actually mixed in with what he was doing, which made it far more interesting. The way a person speaks tells you more about them than anything else I could tell you, where they were born, where they were raised, the big trauma of their life. The way somebody speaks, the way I'm speaking to you now is telling you more about me, Harlan Coben, than I could do by describing myself. You want to keep it as economical as possible. You want to make people sound real. Here's the problem. How people really talk does not make great book dialogue. You have to be authentic, but not necessarily real. You can't have every um and uh and like. People talk in circular ways. So you have to figure out where's the meat and potatoes. You have to really cut down so you're going back and forth as quickly as possible. And then it becomes like a musical piece where it has to have a really nice flow. When you're reading it back to yourself, it has to go nicely without missing any beats, without feeling like we have any false notes. The very last thing that I do with the book is I read the entire book to myself out loud. I know, it's not a fun day. And from there, I can then hear the false notes, especially when I'm doing dialogue. Because people do talk a certain way. They don't say things that don't belong in their particular mouths. And if you read it out loud, it will stand out and you will remove it. I think for me, one of the most satisfying things as a reader is what is not said in the lines, what is said between the lines or underneath the lines. And that's when dialogue really takes off because readers are reading it on two levels. They're looking at what people say, your characters say, and you're also looking at what they mean. In my own family, my dad calls me and my sisters brats one, two, and three. And it's clearly a term of endearment to us, although it can surprise people when they hear it sometimes. But love for us is expressed through other means. So when I wrote Me Before You, what I wanted was for Will and Lou to talk to each other in a way that was sometimes sarcastic, sometimes jokey. It very rarely conveyed what those two characters actually meant to each other. So that towards the climactic moments of the book, when they finally do open up and say the thing they mean, it has so much more emotional resonance. It has heft and it has power, partly because up till this point, they have barely said anything of that nature to each other at all. We, the reader, have watched it because we've seen it conveyed in the way they deal with each other and the things they agree to do for each other. But until that point, we haven't had the reward of two people who say, 
this is what you mean to me. This is how you've changed me. This is what I want for you. And so when it comes, it comes with a much greater force. If you have characters who can clearly express themselves from the beginning, there's actually not that much in it for the reader. You need to keep going back to the decisions you made when you created the story structure. You need to keep revisiting what the scene is really about. What is it that brings the audience into the scene and where does it carry them? What is the new information for the audience in the scene? What is the new information for the characters in the scene that makes them consider new actions and take new actions. The locus of the scene is the setting and the characters who are in it, but you have to consider the vectors, the magnitude and direction of movement that the characters take away from the information that they get in the scene. That is crucial. And if you are writing lots of dialogue that reads well and feels very characterful but isn't propelling the story, then you have to be ruthless. You have to look at a way that you can include the dialogue that you want that reveals character, that is the cute line or the clever moment, but you have to stay on track with the story. The problem with dialogue that just rejoices in its own quality at times is that the story stagnates. So you have to find that balance. And the balance is found in the inclusion of action direction. Within the scene, you have to describe what is physically going on. You have to envisage where characters enter and exit, how they interact physically, if they interact physically and so on. And this is as much a part of the content of the scene as the things they say. So dialogue is important, but it's only important in the context of how it's said, how it's framed. And you need to consider the scene as a whole before you even consider the dialogue within it. How else do you learn about dialogue? A lot of it is eavesdropping. This is one of the fringe benefits of my job. I am an inveterate eavesdropper. When I'm going to coffee shop, I'm eavesdropping on the people next to me. I'm not being nosy. That's research. That's research for you too now. Part of the writer's mind frame. You're allowed to listen in on people. When I was starting out, I used to rent an office above a hairdresser. And in summer especially, I would open my window and just listen to the conversations that were outside. And from that, I learned all sorts of things, what people say, what they don't say, speech patterns, rhythms, stuttering, non-stuttering. I basically just learned to hear many different kinds of speech and many different ways that people communicate with each other. And again, I never replicate that in full, but what you do if you become a good listener is you start to absorb the many different ways that people communicate with each other. And people do communicate in very, very different ways. But write down what you think makes something in dialogue compelling. What's that little phrase, that little expression that brings it all to life? 